Last year, I did an interview um, with a couple where both had experienced divorce and remarried and they built a successful union. So they didn't get remarried to each other. They actually got divorced from previous marriages and then decided to take the leap and marry one another. And it made me realize how important it is to have couples like this on the podcast where they've experienced divorce. However, decided to say, you know what? I'm going to give myself the grace as well as the permission to boldly embrace the ability to establish and build a healthy union. So in other words, even though those stats of getting married the second and the third time are higher, I'm not going to allow that to be the reason why I want pursue this again. And so what this means is that regardless of what folks got to say, <laughs> right, I'm not going to allow what their fears are to interfere with what my faith is. And when, you know, if I can be honest, divorce is a major life event. I think it's safe to say it is. Um, it can disrupt a lot of things, whether that be your finances, your children, and the impact it can have on them. It can also impact your faith. It can impact your lifestyle, right? You know, some people have to move from the homes that they were once in. Um, your kids may have to go to another school. The family ties that are involved, like your extended family to even your own personal family traditions. Friendships may part ways. And not to mention, in my opinion, one of the most, probably one of the most important things is the most mental and emotional impact. And so when you unfold and unravel these different areas of your life, one may ask themselves, well, do I have what it takes to do this again? You know, is it really worth the risk? Um, would it be better if I just like shut down this part of my life to avoid getting hurt again? Maybe I don't want to take the chance and put my kids through this. Like, I feel like I've They've been through enough. I don't really want to put them through that or better yet. I don't want to experience or feel that type of failure again. And one of the things we do over here on this podcast is that we help you become so intentional about your next chapter that you don't allow what has happened to you in a previous chapter become so influential that it gets in the way of what can happen for you going forward. And that also includes the area of relationships, specifically in this episode from a romantic perspective. And what I wanted to do today is that I wanted to bring a couple on that I love to death. Okay. Death, not with F. Okay. <laughs> That's how much I love them. Right. I, I love them. I think they are amazing. They're such a dope couple. Um, and my guest for today is Cherie and Glenn P. Brooks Jr. I got to say all of that because you can't leave nothing out of that because I promise you he will come through these cameras and attack me, okay? Um, but I, I love them. I've had the pleasure of knowing them for about maybe five or six years. I met them in a community, right? And we established a, a great relationship. Um, I call them unk. They like aunt, uh, unk and auntie. You know, that we got that real cool unk and that real cool auntie. Um, I like to put them in that category. Um, and they've been married for 24 years. I think they just came up on a 24th year anniversary. Um, they are both authors, they're speakers, they're coaches, and they specialize in the area of relationship development and relationship strategy. And they work with couples, they work with singles, they work with parents, educators, business leaders, like they work with all these different um, individuals to help them create healthy and functional relationships in their personal and professional lives as well, in order to aid them to better connect and communication with others. And so um, I am blessed to have them here. And without further ado, I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for coming in last minute. You are okay? welcome. It's all good. <laughs> no problem. It's all good. Tanya is funny because when we met um, in the business community that you were speaking of, um, that was virtual at first. And I remember the first time, I think I had a speaking engagement in Atlanta and uh, we did a meetup and um, just a random meetup for all the people that, you know, we work with in that, that, um, that metropolitan area. 
and you pulled up and it was the first time we got a chance to meet face to face and what's funny and consistent with a lot of the meetups that we do people often will say oh my god y'all are the same people in person that you are like virtually and i can right. say that about you i've had a the honor of, of watching you grow over the years as podcasts, not all that and all the coaching and, and different services and things that you provide. And uh, it's our pleasure. I told Sheree about it when, you know, I, you, you hit, you call it last minute, but this is what we do every day, all day, all the time. And for us, as long as it's on the calendar and we can find out a space to fit it in, it's all good. So uh, I'm Glenn P. Brooks, Jr. This is the lovely Sheree A. Brooks, Jr. Um, and Tanya, it's a pleasure being here. And I'm going to say this because it's Saturday and we don't normally do it on Saturday. But for you, we are doing this for you. The answer is absolutely it's always yes. yes. <laughs> when I tell you, see... <laughs> That yeah, that's what family does. That's what family that, does. It does. You know what I'm it, when you call your aunt and your auntie, what they going to do? Say listen, no. Listen, <laughs> exactly. And you know what? It's the same for Glenn. Glenn will say, hey, I need you to, can you, you got five minutes. It's like everything stop. What's up? What, what you need? And so this is the type of relationship that we have. Um, Glenn, they have been a big influence in my life. Glenn has been my personal relationship coach for some years and he's also coached my son he's 20 now and he was doing it in high school and so Glenn has been they have been very like I, I feel I'm very honored to to have them in 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 my life and I appreciate you all so much and um thank you for being here and um I, I wanted to bring you all on because I wanted to keep this conversation going in the in terms of the courage to love again um, specifically when you've been through something such as a divorce. And I know for both of you individually, you did um, experience divorce um, in your lives. And so um, how long were you both married previously? So, we got to get um, our fingers and toes. Yeah, I yeah, mean. <laughs> I gotta think about it. So um, I've been married twice previously before Glenn and I got married. The first time, um, legally, we were married like seven years. We were actually together maybe three years. Um, and the second marriage, we were together for, I think, three and a half years. And so those bo both of those marriages were short, but they definitely still had an impact on my life. And, you know, going through divorce is never easy. I don't care if you've been married six months. It's still um, traumatic in a lot of ways. And so for me, um, having had those two previous, I, I like to say I've been married most of my adult life. If I look at it from I got married the first time at 19. Um, was with him. Then we finally got divorced and then I got married again. Then that marriage ended. And I have a few years in between where I was single, but there was no real long stretch of my adulthood when I have not been legally, quote unquote, married. Okay. Yeah, for me, um, it was, uh, I always say 12 um, un uh, interrupted years. I'll put it that way. Um, you know, Sheree and I have been married 24 years in a row. In a row. And we say that on purpose because we know what it's like to be married and it be an interruption and uh, there'd be separation and all the things. And so I was married 12 years, um, nine years uh, before we separated and we were separated for three years. And uh, that's when I, for me, and kind of in keeping with what you're talking about, particularly um, with doing stuff on purpose and with great intentionality. For me, Tanya, I just really used those three years and was starting to do some self-work um, on me. And uh, because I knew that it was definitely in the cards for me to do it again. Um, growing up in church, I knew what God's plan and design for marriage was. I just couldn't live up to it and I couldn't mm -hmm. figure it out. So I had to go on a journey and figure out what was wrong with me, what was broken in me and caused me to cut up the way I did in my first marriage, knowing uh, better in, in some regard. So yeah, yeah, that's us, that's us. <laughs> no, that's good, that's good, I appreciate that. Um, what do you think got to the point of dissolving you all's first marriage? Like, I, I'm sure it's a, quite a few things, right? I think it's safe to say it's not just maybe one thing, but I mean, and I know it's been a while, but um, what do you, where do you feel like um, got to a point where I say, you know what, this, this needs to dissolve. This isn't going to go any further than, than this. Well, I know I can speak for me. Um, my first marriage, like I said, I was 19 when I got married. I was in the Marine Corps and I had no understanding of what marriage was. We both were young. We were immature. 
Um, we both had our own sets of issues. Um, the relationship had turned volatile and it came to a point where I just was like, I know this is not right and I have to leave. Um, in that relationship, the second relationship, I like to say I had the most pleasant divorce with my second husband. Mm. <laughs> um, we were friends before we got married. Um, we got married. We had a great friendship. We had a great relationship. Um, I had had a daughter in my first marriage and I knew I did not want to have any more children. He had a desire to have children. And we came to an impasse and I realized, you know, I cared more for him having the desire of having child children than for me to be selfish and say, I'm gonna stay in this relationship. And so we kind of parted because he wanted to have children. And so it's funny, cause even the day we went to court for our divorce, we went out to lunch afterwards with my mom and we stayed friends. I mean, we still stay in contact today, um, but that was different, I like to say, um, but it was still hard because I still made a commitment to a person and just being able to separate. And I think for me, the biggest thing I think in that particular divorce was just the level of maturity that I had grown to that I was willing to put somebody else first. And that mm. was the beginning of me starting doing my work on me um, prior to me and Glenn getting together. Mm. Yeah, that's that's funny that you say that, Sheree, because when you talk about maturity and growing to a place where you could end things amicably, you know, we don't see a lot of that today. You know, um, you don't see people deciding, you know what, this does this. A doesn't work, B isn't working, and C isn't going to work because there's some things that we um, either A don't want to change, things that have gone so left that the the time that it takes to fix that we're not willing to commit to um, for a myriad of reasons. And uh, I think that for me, um, you know, kind of like in Cherie's first marriage, highly dysfunctional. And um, I never will forget in those three years of being separated, I was realizing I didn't want this. This wasn't something that I wanted to continue to grow in, but also realized I didn't know how. And I think that that part was more frustrating than anything else. It's like, because even if I wanted to, how would I fix this? Um, you know, just mm -hmm. a quick, quick backstory. I was unfaithful within the first two years of our relationship and I had stepped out and and, and then I realized that there was something going on with me regarding committing mm. and um, and sort of adopting the mindset that, bro, you ain't single no more. Like, like legit, right. like this is y'all and you got to go all in. I was not all in. And uh, so when it came time for us to dissolve it, it was a long, arduous process for me because I really could not wrap my mind around, A, this was ending in this way. B, I'm wrong on so many levels. C, you know, how am I going to save face? Because we were growing up in the church and it was a situation. It was it was rough. And uh, we had just come to the conclusion we don't work no more and we're not willing to do the work or we don't know the right work to do. So let's just let's just uh, let's let's call this quits and let's figure it out. I filed and because uh, we were separated. <laughs> I want to say she filed the next day and we didn't know each other was filing. So it was crazy. So, yeah. Wow, that's good. Um, I know you mentioned that you didn't know how to turn the switch off of saying, I'm no longer single, I'm married. And one of the things that you both said is that you all had to do some level of work. And I think that's the part that I believe is the gap um, when you dissolve a, a, a marriage. And wanting to desire that again, that, that gap of the work. And I think that's the part that I really want to kind of get into because you both said it. Um, and when, when we talk about the work, um, and I'm sure that it, that can be a whole conversation in itself, but let's just stick to the part of the, the marriage, like the, the dissolving of the marriage and what the work looked like for you in that department and in that area. And so I want to ask you all, like, what was it that helped you in that part of your life that allowed you to show up differently in your marriage? You want to go first? <laughs> yeah, I think that um, um, for me, I recognize that 98.9% .9 of our dissolve was my fault. Wow. And I was extremely self-aware of that. Um, and I'm not even talking about the outward uh, infidelity. I'm talking about the inward, 
hiding the N word, um, the inner thoughts of, I don't want this anymore. And I don't know how to articulate that. So for me, the initial work was wrapping my mind around moving from self-awareness to self-management. Like, how do I manage? How do, how do I act on that? What do I do? I remember at first trying to save it. Right. And we went, I never will forget sitting down with our pastor and, um, and, and, and God bless her. She's gone on to be with the Lord, but her limited knowledge of how to fix marriages was simply to pray. And I thought that was, you know, obviously as a believer, you're like, okay, that works. Let's pray. Like, you know, you hear people talk about, we'll put God first and that sort of stuff. For me, that was always an integral part of my life. So putting God first in my mind, I was already doing that, but it ain't working. So for me, I, I had to realize I had to figure out, you know, how to come to that conclusion. And to be really honest with you, Tanya, I don't think I handled that well in the beginning because I didn't know what to do. That when it came to the work of dissolving the marriage, all I knew was to file for divorce. I'm so sorry. I, I did not know. I knew I was broken. I knew something was wrong. I knew I didn't know how to fix it. And I knew we went to counseling, marriage counseling in terms of Christian sitting down with your pastor, not, not professional, not, you know, some therapist somewhere. I didn't know to go to a therapist. Mm -hmm. I, I had no idea back in those days. It wasn't you know, now is Jesus coffee and therapy, not necessarily in that order, but you know what, listen, we, <laughs> we for all of that, but that wasn't the case. And so I handled mine really badly. And it was a, a situation where I, I spent years regretting that as I learned more of, of how I could have handled it. And so now when I work with couples, I work with them from that perspective. Oh, there's a very different way. If this thing is going down in flames, there's a way to do it and not get burned. Mm -hmm. Y'all can write that down somewhere. I know that sounds good. I, I, ain't, I, ain't, I, ain't, I ain't never said that before. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, yeah, right, so you write that, that right. Because I, I don't know if I can repeat that, Sheree. Right. And I know for me, um, it definitely started with self-awareness. Um, it started with me recognizing the part that I play. Because I'm a firm believer that in no relationship when things go like it's never all one person's fault. Um, even if you only played 1%, you have to take ownership of that 1%. Um, and I'll talk about my first marriage more. So I was, like I said, I was extremely immature. We both were immature, but even when, you know, things got crazy and we finally, you know, and, and our relationship, it, even the three years was not in a row. It's like, we were separated probably more time than we were actually together. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point in my life, I looked at marriage. It was an extension of dating. It's like, okay, we go together, but now we just married, but there was no, the, the shift didn't happen in either one of our minds. And so when things did end, I had to look at myself and I had to do some really deep inner work and look back at, you know, where did my idea of marriage come from? Um, my parents are still married today, but their relationship is not necessarily the model that I wanted for marriage. They're together. I mean, they got married in the 50s, but they're, they're, they're just married, I guess is the best way that I can say it. Um, they have the commitment to be married together, but it's not a loving, a open, loving relationship. They don't really spend time together, things like that. And I knew that's not what I wanted. Um, and so I had to go back and look at where did my foundation, my, my ideals of marriage come from, and then start to tear that apart mm. and see what was true and what wasn't true. Um, I grew up in the era, era of the Huxtables. And so that's like one standard that I'm reaching for. But then I have my parents here and it's like I had to find that middle ground. And it took me a long time to find that because I had some very unrealistic expectations of what I thought a husband was supposed to be, mm. of who I thought he was supposed to be. And I was not willing to take ownership of that initially. And it took me time. And I did go to therapy. Um, because I realized that there was something in me that couldn't help me get past this fantasy that I had of marriage. Um, I grew up in a home where we did not communicate. So that was like one of my major points of self-awareness. I realized I'm not a communicator. I don't know how to tell somebody when I don't like something, when I like something, how I feel about something. And that led to the destruction of both of my marriages because I wasn't open. I wasn't honest. I wasn't able to share really where I was until things hit the fan. And then, you know, I'm an exploder. <laughs> it's like when I get frustrated, it'll come out, but I haven't had the conversation for three years. I haven't told you 
you know, with my second, I didn't tell you, I really don't want to have kids. You mm-hmm. told me at the beginning you did. And I'm like, oh, okay. But I never mm-hmm. really sat down and had the conversation. So when, you know, the ish hit the fan, it's like, that's not what I want. But he's been in his mind believing that I'm going along with this, that that's going to happen some type of way. And so I had to really look at myself. And even in that relationship, I had to bear the brunt of my lack of communication as a major proponent to that marriage ending. Um, I had to learn to forgive myself because I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know how to communicate. Um, And I started working on learning how to communicate because I didn't want to be there again. I always felt in my heart that I was supposed to be married. I believe I I was supposed to be a wife, but I didn't want to be a wife in that way. I tried it twice. That didn't work. So I got to do something different because this is not working. Um, And then, you know, they say three times is a charm. No, just one. (laughs) You know what I mean? I'm I'm just saying. We're not talking to him right now. Just sit over there. (laughs) So, I mean, and it was, like I said, I had to really look at me Mm. and do my work. It wasn't about them. I had to learn to forgive with my first husband. I had to forgive him for everything that happened in a relationship because he didn't know what he didn't know either. We both were immature. We were both kids and I had to let that go because as long as I held on to that, I was stunning my own growth. I wasn't allowing myself to be open because I was bitter. I was walking around in bitterness and you're never going to attract what you want, unless you want more bitterness, if you don't let that go. And so it really started with me focusing on me. It wasn't about them. It was not about blaming them. Yeah, they may have played their parts. They, they did their parts, but I had to focus on me mm. and not them. I couldn't live my life rehearsing what they did, what they didn't do, because I would have stayed stuck. Absolutely. And that's the thing about divorcing the story, right? So, you know, that's what I talk about all the time. That's the title of the book because that previous chapter can be so influential to the chapters ahead. And so I love how you say, you know what? I can't focus on them. I got to look at me. I got to look at the woman in the mirror and look at the things that I didn't do. So that way, and you, you also said, I felt like in my heart that I was, you know, one of your purposes was to be a wife on this earth. Yeah. And so it kind of makes me want to ask this question in, in terms of learning about yourself with doing this type of work, how did it prepare you for 24 years? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I'm being honest because right, right. that gap, like, I feel like that it's the, it's the, it's that part, I think is so vital to why second and third marriages dissolve, oh, right, right. Is, is that inability to, to self-assess um, and also self-manage. Right. And so what did, what did you all both learn to say, you know what, this was very influential to how I showed up with Glenn, or this was how, you know, this helped me show up on how I was with Cherie. Like, let's Let's talk so, about that. So I'll go first. So I had to recognize that number one, the men that I had been involved with before um, were men to some degree that I could control. Ooh. Um, that mm. <laughs> I was wow. a controller. Um, I wanted to dictate the pace and they allowed me to in a lot of ways. I won't say they were necessarily passive, but they definitely had some passive tendencies and I was running things in a lot of ways. Um, and I realized that if I wanted to have a successful relationship, that wasn't going to work. I needed to be with somebody that was stronger than me, somebody that could check me basically. Um, and when Glenn and I met, but let me, before that, I also realized I had never learned how to submit, submit to the authority in any shape or form. I never really submitted to my parents. Um, I was the rebellious child. Um, I didn't submit to authority well, even though I was in the military, I always had a challenge with that. I never learned to submit to God. And so it started with me developing a relationship with God and learning how to submit to God first, um, because I had never done that. I had never learned how to submit. Like I said, I was the controller. I was running things. I wasn't submitting to nobody. I wasn't, the word submission wasn't in my vocabulary. Not to mention it makes most people cringe it's almost like a cuss word just because of how it's been used and how people have abused it right um and so I think that's really really important because it's interesting because the couple that I had on last year 
she said the same thing. She said the exact same thing. And um, that's a whole podcast in itself, um, Sheree. Oh, I mean, yeah. we, we, may, we, we really may have to come back and <laughs> just have a whole, no, right. and, you know, seriously, because I know like when that word is used, it's like, I ain't submitting to nobody, but right. in its truest form, right, it can right. be very powerful. Yes, it is. And I think that that's yeah. the thing. The culture has given us a misinterpretation of what submission is. Mm-hmm. And we look at it on the far left end of that's what submission is. And, you know, as strong women, like I'm not submitting to nobody, but that submission is not a sign of weakness. It's it's not. And so, yeah. you know, and like, we're going to have to come back and talk about that. Yeah, but that yeah, that right yeah. there is. Yeah, it is. It's, 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 it's so powerful. And it's crazy because you, you said the same thing that Keisha said on the episode with her husband. Yeah, she said she had to learn how to do that. Um, so, wow. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> and so when Glenn and I met, number one, we st- I, I did everything different this time. I knew in my heart, yes, I'm supposed to be married. But when we met, we were just friends. There was no interest on either one of our parts. I didn't like him like that. He didn't like me like that. And so and I, and I honestly believe God orchestrated it that way, because if I had kept doing things the way I had done it before, I probably would have wound up with the same re- results. Mm. because I didn't know but one way to have relationships even though I was working on me I still my mind when it came to relationships you meet somebody you're attracted to you date you become physical and it goes through that normal pattern but with us we actually developed a friendship where there was no interest and we got to know each other um, and I can remember even us being friends it would be times when Glenn would say stuff to me and I'm like who the heck he think he talking to but I learned to submit to him even as a friend. And it wasn't like he was saying nothing off the wall, but he would like be like, oh, you wearing your hair like that? Like little things. And I'd be like, what? Because I wasn't used to anybody checking me or saying anything, critiquing me at all. And, but I learned how to do that in our friendship. So by the time we started dating, I still didn't like him. I didn't like that part of him. I'll say that. I didn't like the fact that he was strong enough to check me but every time um he would check me it's literally it's like I would hear God's voice telling me to shut up Mm. and just go with it and he never you know he wasn't abusive with it he didn't abuse that power at all but I had to learn to submit and in that that's honestly why I think we've been able to you know be married now for 24 years because I learned how to release some control. It doesn't mean I don't still, I'm still responsible for me. You know, I have ultimate control over me, but also as a, you know, I was a single parent at that point in time, there was a sense of relief being able to have somebody that I knew I could rely on. I didn't have to carry the weight anymore. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my first two marriages, even though I had husbands, I was still carrying all the weight because I was the one, you know, running things. And so there was a sense of relief. And I think that when we get married as women, we want somebody that's going to come and partner with us. That's going to help share that load. But if you don't learn how to let go of some of that control, you're still carrying the weight. Mm -hmm. And then what, for me, I recognized that if I had somebody else that I could run all over, there's a level of resentment that I eventually develop. Because now I feel like, what do I need you for if I'm doing everything? Mm-hmm. only to bring it back up in their face too right yeah it's uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> listen i'm <laughs> listen <laughs> listen listen so so so, so I, I don't i didn't have forgot the question because i'm caught up in my wife's story because i'm hearing some stuff that i did not understand from that standpoint sheree and i think that one of the things that i want your listeners and your viewers tanya to really get is this the idea of I have such a level of trust and commitment to this person that I am willing to relinquish what control I do own and that I do have. So as a single Black woman, as a single parent, as a whole grown woman, clearly you have control and you should. You Mm -hmm. should. You should take charge because it's only you. Those kids need you to take charge. Mm-hmm. However, 
there comes a point in your life when you are trying to make room for somebody else. And this just doesn't happen in marriages. Like this could be a new job. This could be a new opportunity yeah. where if you are used to running things, your team doesn't serve a purpose anymore. And what we know about sports is when you got a alpha male, if you will, that will take over a game. The problem is, is that they can't score enough points by themselves to win it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. So in your marriage or in your relationship, it's like, yeah, how, how's that working for you? And so I think that Cherie makes a, a valid point. And y'all probably should should really get together and have just a ladies conversation around that. I would love to listen and share with every man on the planet, because the truth of the matter is, is that this culture, particularly where feminism is so alive, and I look at it a lot like oppression. When you've been oppressed for a very long time, you're trying to shake off all those grave clothes and you ain't trying to deal with nothing that resembles bondage. And to a large, large degree, that's what that looks like to so many relationships. And I'm just grateful that I got connected with somebody that was willing to do that work. And um, and I'm I'm prepared to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, as you have questions for it, that work is real and, and, and it's exhaustive. And I think that that's why the numbers in second, you know, first marriages on average are in, ending anywhere from 48 to 50 percent um, in, in divorce. Uh, second marriages are anywhere from 60, uh, uh, 60 to 65. And then and then and then third marriages are 75 percent and better. Um, and so technically we should not have made it this long. And I think that one of the reasons why is because we were committed to identifying the right work and then doing it. Yeah. yeah. And, and the funny thing about that, even as Glenn says, the, st the statistics, if you think about it, so if you go through something once, you're supposed to learn something from it. If you go through it a mm -hmm. second time, you're supposed to learn something from it. So by the time you get to the third time, you should have learned some lessons. But I think a lot of times because we're so focused on blaming, we don't mm -hmm. learn those lessons. And therefore, when we get into the third, fourth, fifth marriage, we never learned what we were what we were supposed to learn. And therefore, yeah. that's why you continue to have failed relationships because we're so busy looking at the other person. Yeah, that's that's good. And so I know Sheree kind of gave a lot in terms of why wow, the, these are the things that prepared me for 24 years. And so it's only right that I, <laughs> you know, yeah. ask the man. Like, what was yeah. it that, you know, what, what helped you prepare for 24 years? You know, I think that if I, if I'm honest, when I think back 24 years ago, and it's funny, it's not hard to do that. We're just coming off of, um, you know, a 24th anniversary and Sheree and I have a habit around that time of the year of doing a lot of reflecting. We talk about our journey a lot because it was so adventurous to, to a large degree because of the different things that we encountered. Like, I mean, from moving from one city to another, uh, watching our kids go to college, not watching our kids drop out of high school. We're not going to, uh, you know, mention names that, that, like, and going through all the things, blending the family. Um, this 24th anniversary that we just celebrated, we invited the co-parents to come rock with us for 10 days in Panama. Yeah, I saw that. And that that's a whole work. So when, when you ask the question, what did you do to prepare for 24 years? First of all, I do not believe 24 years ago, we saw us 24 years down the road. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me say that. Uh, let me not paint the rosy picture that because things turned out well, that we saw that then. I, I don't think that we could have ever imagined our life working out this well, uh, considering where we had come from. So I think that for me, the, the work that I prepared was, um, or, or the things that I did to prepare for this was getting um, uh, battle tested for the journey, right? So when you think about anybody who is getting ready to set out on a marathon, there is some strict training that you've got to go into to be able to do that. And a lot of it is real mental work. It is wrapping your mind around the idea that this is forever. Mm -hmm. And because of the pain that I had, you know, inflicted and pain that I went through uh, prior, I was like, I don't want to go through that no more. So what do I need to do to not have to go through that? So this is when I decided, OK, we're going to get therapy now. Whether look, we don't need it, but we're getting it. We're going to go sit down with therapists 
for ourselves individually. And so Sheree and I logged thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of therapy individually and then as a couple. Um, the other thing is, is that, and I have to be honest, Sheree, and you probably could concur, I think community was everything for us. It was on purpose and with great intention that we submitted ourselves to communities of people who were doing it on a high level. And we went ham trying to find those communities. And when we got a hold of that and we identified or found our tribe, you talk about loving them hard, we wouldn't let go. And for us, it, it really provided like foundationally a practical application of, yo, uh, I just had this conversation with my quote stepdaughter, and this is how I'm feeling. What do you think, bro? Here's the book you need to read. I promise you chapter three going to change your life. And then what I would do is I go read chapter three of a cat that had just gone through that four years prior. Um, so I got a million stories like that. But for me, it was really identifying that we are going on a journey and this journey is forever. We did create a statement and we have a hoodie that says this, that um, our goal, when people say stuff like relationship goals, mm -hmm. um, it, ours <laughs> is really very simple. It's to grow old together. That is mm -hmm. our relationship goal. Now, when mm -hmm. we say the word grow, that word grow means personally and together, we want to grow who we are as human beings. Um, old, meaning we want to see the gray hairs. We want to feel the aches and pains. We want to know that we have scars that says we've been together for a very long time. There's something vintage about that. There's something classic about that. People look at houses that are, quote, old, and they mm -hmm. say they have what? Character. Yeah. Right. So we wanted that in our relationship. And then we wanted to do it together, meaning not apart. I don't know what it's like to sleep on a couch. And because I'm mad with my wife because of yeah. a work I did, she doesn't know what it's like to just I'm going over my mother's. That has never happened in 24 years ever. You know and, what? Go ahead. <laughs> I want to just kind of do a brief crazy. interruption, but. It was a, I don't know, we were doing something, Glenn, I think I was. I don't know if we did an interview or you and I was working on something and you told me this is, I think Sheree, you had COVID and you all couldn't sleep in the same bed. And Glenn, when I tell you, I don't know if he told you this, but I'm just going to put all his business out here. But he was like, he felt some type of way that day. Cause he was like, I never like not shared that space with my wife, but I, he knew, you know, due to the the circumstances, you know, it kind of left you all with no option. And so I was like, oh, that is so sweet. Like I know, you know? right. <laughs> you know, so I'm supposed to be like, go on in their room. I'm sleep on the couch, you know. So it's, you know, you, you don't hear things like that 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 very often. And so I, I just wanted to say that I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just I just and Sheree, you can jump in, but I I just wanted to underscore the fact that for us, it really was about identifying the work that we needed to do for the journey. Think of a road trip that you're going to take and you know you're going to be on the road for the next 12 hours. You're going to get the car serviced before you get on the road. You're going to make sure the oil is changed. You're going to make sure the tires have been rotated. Do you need new tires? You're going to make sure that you have fuel in the vehicle. You're going to make sure that it has a tune-up. You're going to make sure that you have food. You're going to make sure that you do that math on, well, what hotel are we going to stop? Are we going to stop? Um, are we going to drive straight through? Who's going to switch over and drive? Like all of those things prepares you for the journey and that's what we did in the beginning for us and identify what do we need in order for us to successfully make this journey and I think that it just became about implementing that right and the only piece I'll add is that and it's been a continual work it's not like you do it in the beginning and then you stop we've continued to maintain our relationship by continuing to invest and continue doing that work because it's not like you fix yourself and then ooh, I'm good for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. No, there's continual work. Um, us even starting the MAPS Relationship Academy, creating that community gives us a level of accountability because I can't be up in front of other people talking about relationships and mine isn't right. But also mm -hmm. we continue to invest in us. We go through books together. We go through therapy together. We do the things that we need to do continually to invest in our relationship <clears throat> because we've evolved. We're not, I'm not the same person I was when we got married 24 years ago, nor is he. Right. Um, and so it's a continual work. And I think that's the biggest misnomer with people when they do get married mm -hmm. is that you get married, you say, I do, and that's it. Mm. No, the work continues. It's, it's work every day to get up 
I have to yeah. choose to love him daily. Mm. I have to choose to stay in this relationship daily because I could choose tomorrow. I don't want it anymore, but it's a choice I have to make every single day and I have to put in the work to do that. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's um, huge. I know Sheree, you were saying some things that I kind of want to like touch bases on for a question for Glenn, because Sheree said some things about relinquishing control, learning how to submit, needing someone who can, you know, really take the lead. And I know Glenn, you also mentioned that your first marriage, um, there was some time there was, you know, you didn't know how to turn off that, that single, um, mindset into a married man mindset. And so what did you have to learn about yourself individually as a man to show up in a different manner that displays leading a home? Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've, you know, helped challenge men over the years that you don't have a marriage problem. You don't have a husband problem. You don't have a father problem. You have a leadership problem. Mm. And if I can help you grow your level of leadership, I can help you be a better husband. I can help you be a better parent. I can help you be a better boss. The challenge for me was my leadership quotient was at an all time low. Mm. And that leadership starts with leading me. And mm. so when we go back and we talk about self-awareness, many people are very familiar with emotional intelligence. Well, there are four components that make that up. Social self-awareness is just one. That leads to self-management. And then you have relationship, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, social awareness, right? And then that leads to relationship management. So the question becomes, what is, what is your EQ? We know that you're smart. We know that you're brilliant. You got degrees. You've got successful businesses or whatever the case may be that proves that from a scholastic perspective and the acumen, you good. We, we got that. Where, where, where is your ability to move through a scenario by feeling your way through? And I think that for most men, we are not taught that on a grand scale. Even when we've had good fathers, great fathers, great intact families, I would dare say that rarely did we have a father figure or a father sit us down and say, this is how you feel your way through this. Let me give you steps one through five. When dealing with your wife, you need to first listen because she is going to, in many cases, have more to say than you. Now, you do not need to let that go through one and out the other, because that's where she's going to give you clues on how to lead her. But if you dismiss listening to her as rhetoric, and she's always upset, or she's not, no, she's not nagging. She is making a declaration. The problem is, is that the problem never got solved. And so now it's turned into pain. And when it turns into pain, the truth of the matter is, is that that's annoying. That's why nagging sounds annoying. There's a pain there that she has not gotten fixed yet. And what I had to do as a husband is learn how to raise my level of leadership to the point that where I could hear the pain in what she was saying and not necessarily move in to fix it right away, but listen enough to ask the right questions so that I could direct them back at her and ask her, well, why are you stuck? And how would you like me to help you? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to help you? So when you ask that question, Tanya, for me, and I get real passionate about that because it, it puts the onus back on me. I, I'm here because I screwed up in the first the first time around, or I, I'm trying to fix this forward because I've got lessons that I've learned. So I think that for me, one of the things that I had to realize right away, especially dealing with this one, because not only is she a Marine, but she's from Southeast DC. <laughs> yes, I'm saying don't let the smooth taste fool you. You feel me? And this one will challenge you toe to toe with highly opinionated, very smart. Um, super analytical, all of the things that quite honestly, many of which I'm not mm -hmm. as, 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 as smart as people think I am, I've learned that I've, I've become that I was not always that guy. So I, I, I say that and, and I'm making a little light of it, but the truth of the matter is Sheree made me work to lead her was work. So I had to first lean in and learn to lead me. And so that was the thing I think that I did right away as a man. I had to challenge my leadership and ask myself the question, would I follow me? Ooh. And, that and, right and, there. and for me, I had, if I was mm -hmm. honest, I had to say, nah, bro, I, I couldn't trust you as far as I could throw you, to be honest with you. 
but we we don't put that off. We don't say that out loud to ourselves to say, okay, if you wouldn't lead you, then why? And then what do you need to do to fix that? Because if you wouldn't lead you, if you wouldn't follow you, then why do you think the one that you share a bed with will? She knows you, Jack, more than anybody. And so she knows what it is and what it ain't. And mm. so let's let's get this together. I hope that answered your question. Oh, it did. And I felt the passion. I was like, that I mean, and I love it. No, I, I think I think that's really good because when you are um that type of, of woman and you've been that way, there's a level of trust that I believe has to be displayed, even though you still choose to trust, but there's still a level of saying, okay, what do I need to display to show that I have the capability to be an effective leader? You know what I'm saying? Because that's an influence that everybody in the household has to be willing to submit to. And so that's why I wanted to ask that question. That's that's really good. Um, one of the things that you all talk about a lot um, is that you you all talk to a lot of singles. And I, I love that. And I think that's, that's a, um, I think singles or talking about, um, you know, embracing singleness is very undervalued. And, but I think it's also significant. Um, how is it, how important is it to embrace that season of your life? For some seasons, for some people, their seasons are longer. Um, for some, it's different. So everybody's season is different, but um, how important it is to embrace that part? Because I, I, you know, I did a podcast episode last week about why you're single. Um, because many people, I've seen it, and you all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen it where it gets like um, people tend to shame others for being single. Um, they tend to try to look for everything wrong with them because they are. Um, and I don't know if I necessarily agree with that concept. I, I, I believe that it, it's a season that I believe that can really do a lot for you if you embrace it. And so, but I think it's more tolerated than embrace. And so how, how important it is to fully embrace that season of your life? Um, I think that definitely you should embrace it. I think that in your singledom, you have the opportunity to work on yourself. You have the opportunity to focus on you. Um, I think a lot of people, they, like I said, we have this idea of what marriage is and, you know, it, it's definitely, I mean, it's nothing wrong with having that as a goal. It's something that you want, but recognize that when you get married, you lose your autonomy. And in your singledom, you have your autonomy. You have the opportunity to do the things that you want to do. You have the opportunity to work on yourself. Now, there are certain certain things that you will never be able to, certain muscles, I'll say, that you'll never be able to fully develop until you're married. Like as far as really having communication skills with a spouse, certain things, until you're in it, you're not going to, you can't prepare for that. But I believe that when we come into a relationship, you should be as whole of an individual as you can possibly be. So in your singledom is the opportunity for you to develop yourself to be as whole as possible, because you don't want to bring a broken person with another broken person. You want to be as whole as you possibly can be, you know, experience life, experience traveling, um, focus on your education, whatever the things that you desire to do, enjoy just having the opportunity to just live life because that does change when you get, get married. Not to say that you don't still get to have those experiences, but it's different because you have another person to consider. Absolutely. Um, I can remember even in the season when, before Glenn and I started, before we met and before we started officially dating, spiritually I was in such my relationship with, with God was like here I mean I could spend that quiet time with him I could just totally devote my time to God but when I got married now I had to consider my husband I had to consider everything that had to be done around the house now I still get my time in but it's not like it was then because I could spend all day Saturday if I wanted to just in God's presence I ain't have to worry about fixing dinner for nobody. I had, you know, my daughter was old enough. She could take care of herself. I mean, it's just, I think that that is a season of your life you should cherish because when you do, if you do choose to get married, there are certain aspects of that that you can't carry over into your marriage. And I think that everyone deserves to have that time. I think that everybody should make the most of that time. Like I said, focus on you, focus on your personal development during that time. Like I said, become as whole as possible. If you have traumas for your past, get your therapy done. So you're not bringing all of that into your relationship. 
you know, use that time wisely because once it's gone, it's gone. It's like, you know, we say about youth, once your youth is gone, it's gone. Once your single dumb is gone, it's gone. And that's part of the problem that is a lot of people get married and they still think they're single in marriage. Mm, and they're not is single a, in terms of wholeness. Okay, right, gotcha. Right. Yeah. There, you oh, know, there's good. there's a shift that has to happen when you make that transition. But if you're whole when you come into the marriage, if you're both whole, and that's the key, you both want to be as whole as person. And nobody's gonna be perfect. When I say whole, right. I don't mean perfect. But you're mm-hmm. working on your areas. You've recognized you've had some time of self-reflection and and realize your areas of growth that you need and you're working on them. So you're not coming into the relationship completely broken. You may still have some areas of brokenness, but at least you're aware of them and you're working on them because sure. you've been doing your work. Sure. If I could jump in one of the things that you said, and I realized I never did this to my singleness. I remember being challenged by a good friend of mine. He happened to be my pastor, um, but we were great friends and he would challenge me. He asked me one time, he said, Glenn, how long, if you could total it up in weeks and months, have you been single up until now? Like not in a relationship, not looking for a relationship, not in, 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 and I couldn't answer that question, Tanya. I, I, there was no period of time that I could say that I've been single for longer than a week or two. Mm. A- as a man, I felt like I always had to be in a relationship of some sort. And when I say relationship, I mean, I'm dealing with somebody. So even if we're not, quote, going together, you know, you already know you got them friends with benefits. Let's, not, <laughs> let's, let's just keep it a hundred. So the point I'm making is, is that what that does is it connects you to not dealing with you. Mm, so, yeah. so, so, so for me, because I'm highly relational, I couldn't separate not dealing with a person and, and, and be able to associate that that was the time that I needed to deal with me. Mm-hmm. So that never happened. My, God bless my first wife. She had nothing coming because I had never had the opportunity to figure out who I was and what I wanted out of life and how that would look and none of that. So I think that the importance to embrace your singleness is huge because Cherie said something that's important because once it's gone, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And you never know when that time comes. I can't, I can tell you, I have friends who were so devoted to their singleness. They didn't realize that their opportunity was now like a guy was the right guy was right there. Like, yo, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to do life with you. And you like, but bro, like I'm so enjoying this singleness. I don't see you at all. And I, and, and I have to say that there is a level of envy that I have for a place that I'm that focused that I don't even notice a good thing when it come across my path because I'm on a mission to yeah. fix me. And that's where I think Sheree and I were to some degree, even though she did much more work in that area than I did. I was in a season um, of figuring out what I needed to figure out. Um, and even when we met, like, you know, uh, let me just keep it real. I was dating somebody when I met her. So when she say we were friends, I'm talking to her about the relationship that I'm currently in because I had not mastered that whole idea of not being in a relationship. But there was a solace that I had with being able to be honest with her because there was nothing physical. There was nothing emotional going on. There was nothing. She was just good people. And I remember we would pull up and have coffee. And and, 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 and it's funny because when we were in, when we were in real quick side story, we were in Panama for our 24th, we had an opportunity to sit down with a guy who owns a restaurant from New York. And he was talking about, we were talking about business and how easy it was to build a business there. And he said that he's getting, he just inked a deal to bring Bennigan's, which was a thriving chain of restaurants here in the U S I remember that restaurant. They're in, they're in Panama. And he's like, he's like, bro, we getting ready to redo the menu because he, he has five restaurants and they're going to do they're going to call it Bennigan's on demand. And it's going to be an insert in their menu that you can get a, a Bennigan's menu. And I looked up, I said, bro, you, you know, tell me y'all going to have a Monte Cristo. He was like, bro, are you kidding? So I, I said that because that was a memory of us of being able to have the strawberry tall cake and coffee. And mm-hmm. we were just friends. Right. It was that season though, that I recognized her value 
Because I'm saying to yeah. myself, if I'm this comfortable, there ain't no lies, ain't no deception. She can ask me just about anything. And even though I was shedding some of my old stuff, she was able to peep that and challenge that without me getting defensive because it wasn't it, like, I don't, I don't owe you none. Let me just, like, when you're talking with your friends, you just, you're just honest. You don't owe them to lie to them. Like, why, why, why would I lie to you? Like, I ain't right. got no reason to. So I say all of that to say that I think that for me, you should consider that as a golden opportunity and a moment to be treasured for as long as that season lasts, because you're going to look back on it and thank yourself <laughs> that you did that work. Because when it's gone, man, listen, there are days now we work, we've been working together out of the same space for four years, five years. Listen, that my wife had to go get an office downtown Norfolk just to get out of my face. You understand what I'm saying? Because I look with my high energy, so I'm around the corner talking about what you doing. Hey, what, what you got happening? Bro, I'm working, man. You know the list of 15 things you just gave me two days ago? I'm still work. I'm on a number seven. Get out of my... I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to go to lunch today? Like, bro, like, can you... So I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway, Cherie, I know I, I got face off course. Is, I'm sorry. It's so fun. No, no, that's really good. I only have a, a few more questions and um, we'll close out. But it was something you said that I wanted to kind of bring back out because I know you all both mentioned that you were friends. Cherie was like, I ain't like him like that. And you know what I'm saying? And Glenn was like, I'm dating. I was dating somebody when I, when, when we were friends. And so what made you realize Glenn, that this is the woman that I wanted to pursue on purpose. And then for Cherie, what made you say, this was the man that I wanted to be a participant of his pursuing. Ooh, I loved how you characterize that. Mm -hmm. um, for, me, <laughs> for me, I have to say, y'all, and I'm not, again, I go back to saying I'm not that smart. I had several people. God is funny. Through, he will use other people to talk to you about what you should be doing. There was in a span of a few weeks, there was a series of people who kept telling me, had you paid attention to this one like that? Do you think it's an accident that she is this selfless? Do you think it's an accident that she is this caring? Do you think it's an accident that she's this communicative? All the, the qualities of a person that I really wanted to be with. And I mean, this, this range was deep down to a person that I was dating. You ain't supposed to be with me. You're supposed to be with Sheree. Now, when you when a girl you date, <laughs> you are seeing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm says to you, bruh, I know we hang out, we do, and we do all of it. That's your, that's, that's your person. Right. So it's funny that you asked that, but I really came to a conclusion that I had a call on my life that required a certain kind of character of a person to help me fulfill it. Even amid all my crazy, I knew deep down inside, God had a, an assignment on my life and that that assignment could not be fulfilled by me alone, and that I need to be coupled with somebody that had the, the character to show up. And that's why I'm so grateful that when we look back at, after 24 years, I'm like, nobody else could have went through what we've gone through the last 20 years with me but you. No, like nobody, like all the people I know that I don't know a person. And, and the reason why is because I think that she was she was prepared for me. And, 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 I, and I had to say it that way because she did the work you know, certainly God inspired, but she was prepared for me. And that's one of the things that made me realize, no, this is my person. And she's always been my person. We were just friends. And so what would it look like to marry your best friend? I don't know. I asked her four times. She said, no, three, because <laughs> I wasn't right yet. I wasn't finished. I wasn't finished baking. <laughs> you know what I'm and it's funny that you asked that question. So early in our friendship, and I'm not a spooky spiritual person, but God told me that he was going to be in my life. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't really pay attention because I wasn't trying to be in a relationship, but God told me that very early in our friendship. And so as time evolved and we got to know each other, um, it just kind of it's like we kind of just fell into being in a relationship. It wasn't it just was a natural progression. It wasn't like 
it was like no light bulb moment, like, ooh, you know, we sitting across from each other, it's like, oh, you're the one. Um, it was just a natural progression. It was like our relationship, our friendship had developed to a point that it was like, like Glenn said, why not be with your best friend? Um, like I said, I had done relationships the traditional way before, where it's all about the physical attraction and all of that. Um, but because our friendship was the foundation, it just kind of moved into that easily. And when he talks about, you know, he asked me to marry him four times, the first three times I knew because we were friends, I knew things he was dealing with. And I was like, nah, you need to get that straight first. <laughs> nah, you, you, you need, see, did you see that finger? Yeah, I was like, mm-hmm. no, you need, <laughs> you need to work on that first. Like, uh, uh-uh. uh, and it was like, and also he was, in all honesty, I think the first two times he was fearful of losing me because I had got to a point with certain things that he was dealing with that I was like, you know, if you don't get that straight, I can't look. We, I'm not. I ain't got time for this. Mm-hmm. And so I was at a point I wasn't so invested. And this is the thing for me that was key, because, like I said, I had done a traditional way before. And when you become sex, you know, sexually involved with a person, there's a soul tie that develops and it's harder to walk away. Mm-hmm. I was in a place that I was able to if I needed to, I could just walk away. Yes, I would have missed my friend, but I wasn't attached to him like that. And so when I was a- I was able to see clearly my vision was not skewed. Right. Because there was not, I wasn't in love with him like that, um, in love, I'm gonna say love, in love <laughs> with him. You know, it wasn't all I, of the, love, the feelings and all you. of that wasn't there. It was just, it was a real friendship. And so I was able to think clearly and I'm a logical person. I, I, I'm a strategic person. So as I was here, so if this ain't right, this, you're not checking the box. And so I was able to, I was in a position that I was able to put up clear boundaries and really stand by them because I had not gotten emotionally attached to him in that way. Um, That's huge, Sheree. And let me just say this, please, because Tanya, I know we're winding down on time. Y'all, let me say this. For those of you guys who are listening, do yourself a favor and go do some work and read some books. If you need to reach out to us, we can certainly help you. But go do the work on what it looks like to discover what healthy boundaries look like Mm-hmm. what they feel like and how they behave mm-hmm. because a boundary is not a concrete wall that right. walls you in from something to protect you from any boundaries are literally designed to give you freedom. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. not designed to mm-hmm. put somebody on the outside. And now that's just my boundary. You should be, you should ne- if you understood what a healthy boundary looked like, it should be never used in the sentence of something uh, uh, that, that, that is degraded. Now, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Cause that is my bound. If you're talking like that, it ain't a healthy yeah. boundary already. Right. Yeah. So I, it, I need yeah. I need people to understand that, Tanya, because I think that where Cherie was concerned, that's the thing that won me. What won me and what made me realize, oh no, nah, uh-uh. This definitely the one because she will not let me override her value. And I'm gonna say this last thing: what we love and what we value are two different things. I say that often. That People part. can love you out of obligation because you my kid, uh, you my mama, um, you my spouse, uh, you know, you're my business. I'm loving you out of obligation. But what you value is the thing that you spend time with. What you value is the thing that you make adjustments for. What you value is the thing that keeps you up at night and causes you to say, nah, we got to switch this because I'm just not going to let that thing leave my life. No, any old kind of way. That's when you, that's more than, that's a different association than just love. And and I'm going to tell you, you need them both for the healthy relationship to, to be able to thrive. I'm sorry. I just had to stick that in. <laughs> No, that's no, that's no, that's that's really good. Um, that that word value is is key. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people don't 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 get that part right there. But I already know how you are, Unc. I already know you going <laughs> you like no. Nah, let, let me let me just interrupt. Let me let me just chime in right quick. But um, I got one final question because I know that you know people who tend to listen to this podcast are either already going through a divorce or maybe um, completely divorced um, or even maybe even going through a um, non-marital um, breakup. But you already know that there's going to be some, you know, well, I, I don't know if I could be submissive or I don't know if I could do this again or, you know, 
that worked for y'all, but it won't work for me. I, I Sometimes I feel like even in listening to examples of what we say we desire, we'll always find a way to go against it. We'll self-sabotage or we'll think it can happen to us or you don't know my situation. You don't know what I went through type of deal. But one of the things that I believe is I do believe in aiming for what you desire. I believe that wholeheartedly. And I want to ask you all, based upon where that person is right now, who's listening to this podcast, that may be fearful putting their feet back out there in the water, right? How does a person get to the point of being open to doing this again? Right? How, How does a person, you know, what are some things that could be tangible for them to say, you know, how could I get to this point? Because I'm sure you all had to get to this point of choosing to say, I'm going to do this again, and I'm going to do it with you. Right, right. Um, I would just say, you know, first, do take the time to heal. Um, Don't rush into anything. Um, If it is your desire to be in a relationship, again, it's possible. Um, I'm a firm believer in, you know, if, if what you've done before hasn't worked, try something different. Um, oftentimes we will say we have this type of person. This is my type of person. If that's been the type and that didn't work, maybe you need to look in a different pool. Um, but I think the first step is healing completely. Um, getting to the place that you're no longer bitter, do your self work first because you have to heal because what you don't want to do is take the pain from your previous relationship into another relationship because you're setting yourself up for failure when you do that. So take your time. Um, self-care, take care of you, focus on you, love on yourself, learn to love you first so that then you can love on another person so you can be open to love again. I think we oftentimes will carry those hurts, will allow that to turn into, you know, we're point blaming ourselves. And I'm not saying don't take ownership of your part, but don't become a victim. Don't allow yourself to victimize yourself because of a bad situation, because something went wrong. Take your part of ownership of your part, but also then realize there was another person that played a part in that. It wasn't all you. You know, heal from your hurt, heal from the pain, heal from the damage that was caused. And then if you're open to it, if you feel like that's something you want to pursue, pursue it, but maybe approach it differently. Look at things differently. Don't do it the same way you did it in the past and take your time. Don't rush. There's no, I mean, people are getting remarried in their 70s and finding love. So there is no timeline. Don't put yourself on this. I got to redo it. If I'm going to do it again, I got to do it by this age. Don't pressure yourself. Just let it happen naturally. And that's the thing for me with Glenn and I, like I said, our friendship evolved into marriage. I was not looking for a relationship at all. I wasn't closed off to it, but I wasn't looking for it. And I think that's the best um, relationship when you've been through a divorce is don't go out looking for it. If it's mm-hmm. going to happen, it's going to happen. Put it in God's hands, leave it up to him. He'll bring the person if it's supposed to be. Now, the only caveat I'll say with that, you do got to kind of position yourself. You can't stay home all the time and think he's going to just come knock on your door. UPS <laughs> man may not be him. So you got to position yourself. You need to be yeah, out in the be world. Be intentional. Right, yeah. right. You got to be out in the world to be seen. Yeah. But don't, you know, the, the term, I don't know if they still use this, don't be thirsty, <laughs> um, but just take your time. But I think the key is just heal yourself first, love on yourself, learn to love yourself, and then you'll attract love. That's so, good. so really quickly, and, you know, the coach in me wants y'all to write this down. Number one, what Sharice said, heal. Okay. Um, when you are sitting in a place, for those of you guys who are sitting in the place saying, I don't know if I want to ever do this again. I was there um, because of the pain that was caused. Mm-hmm. Here's what I was really saying. I don't know if I ever want to experience this kind of pain anymore. Right. That's what I was really saying. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wasn't saying that I'm done with people. I wasn't saying that I was done re- with relationships. I was saying I was done with pain. So number one, heal. And then for me, I would have to say a strong number two would be discover why. Why do you want to? Um that's good. That's Go good. where you think you want to be. <laughs> yeah. Why? That's good. Um, wh- why do you why why do you think that you know marriage um is for you? Why do you think that it's not for you? I want you to spend some time discovering your why. For me, I recognize that who I was called to be, 
I could not complete that mission by myself. I knew that from the gate. I knew that I had to be, I was, desi- I was made up. My DNA was such that, and, and you have to understand, I never saw a success. My parents were divorced when I was seven years old. So it's not like it was because I was trying to emulate something I had seen. I'd never seen this before, really. But in my heart of hearts, I knew I am destined to, to accomplish some stuff. And what I also knew is that I needed someone who would compliment me. Not some who, listen to this carefully, guys, not someone who would complete me. Because I think that that in of itself is a farce and it's, it's, it's diluted by this culture. We're looking for people to quote, he completes me. Shut up. You sitting there tripping. Ain't no human human being out here designed that that takes way too much power for somebody to complete you. Y'all not a goddamn on puzzle. Don't get me started trying to stay off off the custom ministry over here. Number two. (laughs) So, so stop that. Number two, uh, stop, stop competing. Yeah. You're not in a relationship for kudos. This is not about who does what. That's why I could care less as to, and we've got, we've done the gamut with Sheree. I've made more than Sheree. She's made more than me. I've come back to make more than her. She's made, like that pendulum has swung back and forth so many times over the last 24 years. It's crazy. However, we're in a place now that we never imagined we'd be financial because we don't compete. What we do mm. do is we compliment. Mm. Cherie brings certain things to the table that complements me. If you think of a decor of a home, colors that complement one another, they don't what? Right. Clash. If you can identify that in a relationship, you win it. You are winning. You want somebody that offsets you, the yin to your yang, if you will. But most people have not done the work that it takes to operate in that space of that level of confrontation to be challenged on something. Because in my mind, confrontation is not, doesn't mean fight. It means get better. Right. So the mm-hmm. fact that my wife saw it and then had the wherewithal to say it. And now my job is to take it and do something with that and hear her heart. Because at this particular point, the outcome of that is your boy going to be better. And I got, trust me, I've consistently grown because of this one, not because of me. But it's because I've allowed her to be her in this relationship. And I've I've taken my cue. So I I would just say, guys, discover why do you want this? And and do that work. Because now when it shows up, it begins to make sense. It's like, God, I know why I need to be in a relationship or why I don't need to be in a relationship. This is how you can say no to the idiots. Oh, I don't need that. And I know why. No, sir. No, thank you. God bless you and your mama. I see y'all when I see you. So I, I'm just saying, guys, listen, y'all, please do that work because at the end of the day, um, you can't get to any place of significance by yourself because we all need some help. So sorry. Man, this is that's so good. Um, where can people find you all out here in these internet streets? <laughs> Hilarious. Where can people find you all? Ev- everything Glenn P. Brooks Jr.com. Real simple. Um, everything it, Glenn P. Brooks Jr. I told y'all he'd be serious about that whole name. Look, everything ends. Glenn P. Brooks Jr. Gotta have the JR on the back end.com. Uh, we run a business, uh, it's Glenn P. Brooks Jr. LLC. It's a personal and professional development company. On the personal development side of the equation, we run a community called MAPS. It's an acronym that stands for Marriages and Parenting Successfully. Um, we just celebrated six years of an online private community mm-hmm. that's been thriving. We have helped probably well over 500 families over these six years just grow intensely. Some people come in, they stay in. Some people come in for a short amount of time, get what they need, keep it moving. But we're often just impacting people. And then on the professional development side, we bring these kinds of relationship skills to entrepreneurs, business owners, and ministry leaders who are really trying to discover uh, their one thing. What is the one thing such by doing that it makes everything either easier or unnecessary. And that's where you find yourself being able to generate revenue and quite frankly, impact that, you know, people will talk about for years. So yeah, glennpbrooksjr.com, come on through. And you can also good. and you can also reach me at shereabrooksjr.com. Um and y'all had the name on the end. I got the girl, whole the name. Girl, I, took, I, took the whole, I took the whole thing. I took the whole it's name. It's like a tribe called Quest. You gotta say that. <laughs> right. So shereabrooksjr.com. Also, you can find me on IG and Facebook at shereabrooksjr.com. Okay, that's great. I will put all of that information down in the show notes. Listen. 
this episode was great. Um, I even, I've learned a lot, you know, um, just by listening to you all. And, you know, it's just some, you, you all dropped some amazing gems. And I know this podcast episode is going to be definitely beneficial for you all. And I appreciate you all um, taking out your Saturday that you don't even do these things. For little old me, it means, I mean, seriously, it means a lot to me. It it does. It means a lot to me. You know what I'm saying? I I respect your time and I, um, I respect you both, um, individually and collectively. And, um, I love to see, um, marriages like this, like this is something that I, I look up to, um, this is something that I want my listeners to to look up to as well, because I, I do believe that you, you can have it. You know, um, it may not have worked in the way that we have planned the first time, but let's not make that be the the end all of what could be. And so I appreciate you all for being here. Thank you all so much. And you all have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you. Thanks all for right. having us, Tanya. We love you. Absolutely. Love you, love you too.